I'm Jason Stipp from Morningstar. After a couple of brutal days in the market this week, we're checking in with Morningstar Markets editor Jeremy Glazer for his take on the situation. Jeremy, thanks for joining me. You're welcome, Jason. Saw a big sell-off on Thursday, followed by another sell-off on Friday. What's driving all of this activity as investors are heading toward the exits? Well, it's virtually impossible to ever pinpoint you know, one exact cause for any given day's movement in the stock market. Um, but I think overall, investors are concerned about the global growth picture, and in particular, uh, are concerned about China. Uh, you know, Going into this year and throughout this year, I think there was some hope of global growth looking a little bit better, that Europe really seemed to be turning the corner, the United States continued to chug along, uh, and that China, although slowing, would be able to manage that slowdown, that you weren't going to have the, the hard landing, as people used, used to talk about. Uh, and I think over the last couple of weeks, and in particular into this week, I think there's signs that maybe that thesis just isn't going to hold, um, particularly in China. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of bad news and kind of unusual news out of China uh, when you have the uh, devaluation of their currency. They said they were going to let the market decide. And and then kind of at the last minute uh, intervened because the market was deciding too much. Uh, the intervention in the Chinese stock market, the weak manufacturing data, I think it's really uh, hurt the market's confidence of, of China's ability to manage the economy and to kind of manage this transition from this very investment-led economy to more of a consumer-driven one. I think that's been uh, something that, that's starting to concern uh, investors as they think about what's the impact on Europe, uh, which has more direct trade with China, uh, what's the impact on the United States, how does it impact global uh, currencies, how does it impact the global monetary market, about commodities, about what's happening with emerging markets. And I think as people reevaluate that, uh, you're starting to see some of that shake out uh, through uh, the, the global stock market sell off. We also had Fed minutes recently, and the market had been fo very focused on the Fed, and now the Fed and China. Are Fed concerns possibly contributing to the volatility? Yeah, I, th I think it has to be. I mean, I think the Fed has been just under such intense focus now as we approach the first meeting where it's even possible that they really consider raising rates, uh, they're going to continue to be uh, focused on that. And I would say uh, maybe early in the week, you know, September seemed like like it was priced in as the likely candidate of when it was going to raise. That seems to become less and less likely as the week's gone on, um, partially because the Fed minutes mentioned some international problems as a reason that you might want to wait. And we're seeing those in, in spades uh, over the last couple of days. So maybe that uh, causes the Fed to, to step back and decide it's not quite time yet. Uh, so I think some of the volatility is also coming from that repricing of when the Fed is going to increase rates. Uh, as we've said before, for, I think for the average investor, they shouldn't care too much about it. Uh, but definitely Definitely in the short term, it can create some waves, and we're seeing that right now. If people think the Fed's going to raise rates later, though, would that be a positive for the market or or not? <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting that this is kind of uh, maybe not moving in the exact direction that, that you would expect. Uh, you know, traditionally, you might think, well, uh, if the Fed were to raise rates, that would be uh, potentially slowing the economy down, and maybe that would be bad for the, the stock market of the long term. Um, but I think investors are also saying if they don't raise rates at this point, maybe that's a sign that the economy is actually weaker than we originally thought. That it can't support this rate increase, and that's not a good thing uh, potentially for, for growth either, and maybe speaks to some broader problems that, that, that could pop up uh, across uh, you know, different companies' earnings could, could pop up there. So uh, I think you can see that really, no matter what the Fed does, you know, the market it could find something to, to be worried about. Um, but these are really unconventional monetary policies uh, that we've had put into place. So the exit from it's going to be unconventional too. We don't really know how, how the market's going to react. And again, I, I think that's what we're seeing right now is some uh, volatility as people just try to figure out exactly what does it mean to move off of the, this floor of zero that we've been at for so long. Are any areas of the market getting hammered worse than any other areas? Yeah, energy is getting hit the hardest. And I think a lot of that is because oil prices continue uh, to fall. Uh, and we could add that to another factor that, that, that's driving some of the volatility. Uh, that supply demand imbalance that sent oil lower uh, earlier is still very much in play. And we're hitting new six year lows here. Uh, and oil's below $40 a barrel in the the U.S. Um, because we have a lot of supply and, and there's concern that demand is going to uh, be below that. And uh, as those prices come down, the energy shares are, are coming down with it. Okay. And we can also say uh, Morningstar has a fair value for the market as a whole. We roll up our underlying company fair value estimates. What is the overall market valuation looking like? Yeah. So according to our uh, equity analysts, and remember, this is only companies that we cover. So that tends to be uh, larger cap companies a lot, a lot in the U.S. So it's, it's a snapshot of that portion of the market. Uh, the median company there looks about 5% undervalued right now, uh, which is not a dramatic uh, undervaluation by any stretch of the imagination, uh, not nearly as undervalued as the median 
Bitcoin's stock looked like, uh, say, during the summer of 2011, at the height of, of the Eurozone crisis, or uh, certainly not anywhere close to where it looked like uh, during the financial crisis. Um, so we've gone from maybe a little bit overvalued to a little bit undervalued, um, but more or less we're, we're right around where we think for value is. So if we're not seeing a lot of margin of safety in the market overall, what about individual securities? Can bargain hunters find more opportunities now than they could before we started seeing some of this sell-off? There's more now, if not a ton. Uh, you know, before the sell-off, we could count the number of five stars on one hand. Uh, now we're up to 32, which is not a huge number. Uh, now, a lot of those are in the energy and basic materials section. Uh, you know, that's been hit the hardest, uh, we think, in some cases unfairly. Uh, you know, one company that we really like here is ExxonMobil. It's a wide moat company. We think it has a low uncertainty that we're, we're pretty certain about, uh, you know, what it, its future path looks like. We think that's trading at a really uh, attractive discount right now at five stars. Um, but before you kind of uh, maybe load up on, on more energy shares, I think it's important to look at your portfolio, uh, make sure that your total energy exposure is something that you're comfortable with. Uh, you know, maybe do a portfolio x-ray, see what any mutual funds you own, uh, what kind of energy exposure it has as well. Uh, a lot of those risks uh, may be correlated, and I think it's important uh, in a portfolio context to, to really think about uh, what you're buying. Anything outside of energy looking attractive? Yeah, a few. Uh, Gap, uh, believe it or not, the, the clothing retailer uh, is in five-star territory right now. Uh, you know, there is a sense that their turnaround, at least the market has a sense the turnaround that, that they're trying to uh, accomplish is not uh, maybe going quickly enough, but, but our analyst thinks that uh, it's very much on track and that they're going to see some uh, potential big gains from some new inventory systems and from some brand repositionings they're doing. Uh, she sees those shares as looking attractive right now. Uh, Apollo Global, it's an alternative asset manager, a uh, narrow moat company that we think has, has a good specialization in uh, these illiquid credit instruments, something that we think will serve it well in the years to come. Uh, that is a high uncertainty name, so we're, we're less certain about the, the path uh, that that one could take. Um, but for maybe investors with more of a risk appetite, uh, that could be another interesting one to look at. A lot of Morningstar um, commentary has been saying that the conditions are ripe for volatility. We've been saying it for a little while as market valuations were pretty full or in some cases overvalued. If you had to take out your crystal ball and, and predict if this volatility is going to continue or not, what does it look like? Well, first off, my crystal ball has been broken for quite some time. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to say over any short period of time, you know, exactly what the market's going to do. And I think anyone who tells you that they know what's going to happen in the next month or three months in a year uh, is probably not being totally uh, frank with you. Uh, now, what you can learn from current valuations is maybe what the long-term returns are going to look like. And if we say that shares look about fully valued right now, we can expect kind of a fair return, uh, you know, maybe not the kind of gaudy returns we've had over the last couple of years, bouncing back from those very low valuations of the financial crisis, um, but, but certainly a, a fair return. You're going to be rewarded for the risk you're taking. Um, but the path that we take to get there could be incredibly volatile. I think, like you mentioned, a lot of the rest of a lot of the, the ingredients are there for, for that to happen. Uh, you know, these issues with China aren't going away anytime soon. Uh, the focus on the Fed isn't going away anytime soon uh, as these extraordinary measures are lifted. Uh, even after the first rate increase, that's not going to be it. We're not going to just forget about the Fed. We're going to have to be talking about it every meeting. Are they going to raise again? How fast is it going to happen? What impact is this having on, on the broader economy? Uh, those questions are, aren't going away. Uh, a lot of these concerns about energy and the energy companies, again, not going away. Uh, and when you have, uh, you know, stocks that are really priced in, you know, reasonably good growth, uh, and, and if that growth doesn't materialize, you, you could see some more volatility. Um, so I think this really speaks to the importance of having kind of this long-term plan, that because you can't predict what's happening in the short term, you don't know what's going to happen next week or the week after really have to look out over that longer time horizon, say, I want to hold equities. It makes sense my asset allocation. I'm willing to take on the risk. Uh, I hopefully will get rewarded for that risk, and we think you will at, at these levels, um, and, and really just sticking to that plan uh, and not panicking when you see days like this and not getting you know, too uh, euphoric when they go up a lot and really uh, sticking to it, we think will uh, make uh, the best, uh, most long-term sense. Great perspective on the market, Jeremy. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jason. For Morningstar, I'm Jason Stipp. Thanks for watching.